What's happening? We are with JT Tran from ABCs of Attraction, and I knew you before ABCs of Attraction existed. Actually, I knew of you. That's the thing. Like, right. we don't know each other that well, but dude, let me actually give you this intro because this is some badass shit. <laughs> so you, dude, I remember signing up for the old school meetup board that Dimitri ran. You remember that guy? Well, that's, okay, not that's a bad a... <laughs> dude. He's not an asshole like Greg. Like, fuck right, Greg. Right. Talk about that dipshit on here. But uh, so layers split and JT. JT was the guy who helped found the Dallas, or made it substantial. And you right. did a workshop way back when that a couple of my buddies went to uh, with uh, Brock, who was an old yeah. PA teacher. Yeah. And there's a different profit now but brock was the original and a very yes. cool dude and you remember that guy brian who else you anyway i probably shouldn't <laughs> say that. but dude you on the old school meetup board if you went to that uh there were pictures of you like from 10 years ago with like yeah. three chicks in a hotel room and like <laughs> fucking naked it was like the epitome <laughs> of what it meant to truly be a pua yeah that's the bat and so there's two things number one Kind of legendary in that sense, because this was like 10, 11 years mm -hmm. ago, that. And number two, that is so phenomenally important, which people may not know about you because now you got this badass business and you're doing all this shit, is you made it a community. Like, dude, there are guys like still in Dallas that I could call up right now. Um, my buddy, he went by uh, Double D or Juice. I think you gave yeah. him the name Juice. Yeah. Who it's like, and this guy, Fidelio, that were like, uh, man, you know, back then, before, you know, Captain Jack was a dude, we're talking about some PUA history here, sorry, uh, yeah. that, you know, JT and Brock made this thing work, and uh, before it all got divided, and that was the essence of, you know, community. So, it's fucking pretty cool, man. <laughs> you know, it's it's cool to interview you with all that. Anyway, that's a long intro, but people need to know that, I think, right. about you. So that's um, like... The respect come from. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. It's the thing is, this was like back in the, like you said, like ten years ago, and I had studied with mystery. You know, I had like crashed and partied at Project Hollywood, and at the time, I, I had left my engineering job and I was just kind of like exploring the world and like, what am I gonna do? Like, I saw like the the social matrix and the business matrix. And I'm like, I don't want to be an engineer anymore. I don't want to be like a sexual drone or a worker drone. So I moved to Dallas and I kind of took that attitude of like that Project Hollywood attitude with me to Dallas. Mm. And then I uh, teamed up with Dimitri and we were doing like a couple free workshops. I think what really um, made the mark was I did this massive like mini boot camp where there's so many students and it was like basically free the only thing they paid for was a club cover and i rent i had to rent out like the entire top floor of the club to get like 50 dudes in um and so that was pretty legendary and that kind of really made my mark and things started rolling but then as you said um all the kind of the political infighting started happening and i had to move back to los angeles so you know it all sort of like fell apart well, you also moved back to Los Angeles to start your business. And mm -hmm. not to say you weren't in business then. You were a professional coach back then in 2006, 7, 8, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, like, you took off with ABCs of Attraction big time mm -hmm. when you moved to L.A. That's yeah. what, the way I saw it. Yeah, yeah. Like, back in Dallas, it was just a hobby. You know, like, like my first client was, like, this Chinese-Canadian mother whose son had been harassed by neo-Nazis. So she flew me out. But that was, like... You know, when I was still living in Dallas, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life after engineering, and I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. And so it transitioned from a hobby into something professional, and that's when I decided, okay, I'm going to move back to Los Angeles, which is like the mecca of pickup. But for the, like, right. the two years, three years I was in Dallas, it was very transitional. It was very just me, you know, where I really kind of made my mark as the Asian playboy. That's what I was hardcore pickup. I'm not like hardcore PUA anymore. You know, I may teach the pickup techniques, but I don't really teach the pickup mentality. But back in those days, I was like, I'm going to, you know, do as many girls as yeah. possible. Um, but again, you know, as one grows, one evolves. So I've kind of like left that behind me. But yeah, for a while, Dallas was like the Dallas Project Dallas, really for me. Yeah, dude. Well, let's talk about your evolution. I want to talk mm -hmm. more about Dallas, but fuck, you know, people, only the diehards care about that. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
dude, how have you evolved? Like what's happened? What is ABCs of attraction? You know, you originally started out like learning some mystery stuff. You, mm-hmm. you took it, got went in field, got all this experience to where you're like boning a bunch of chicks in a hotel room, taking pictures and posting them for like guys <laughs> like me coming in at 2006 going, holy shit, this is what's possible. Yeah. And now, I mean, dude, 10 years later, what is ABCs of attraction and what is different? You know, what, what's changed? Well, like I, like I previously mentioned, I may teach the pickup techniques, but I don't really teach the pickup mentality anymore. And a lot of that has to do with not only my growth, um, because for a while, you know, for several years, I was like hardcore, like just die hard. But over yeah. time, you know, both myself, you know, mature, but also my students, like I do tend to concentrate on Asian simply because of who I am. Yeah. And what I've learned is, you know, with mystery, I, I love it. It changed my life. It gave me a new perspective that I never knew that I could take control of this. But the biggest problem was it was all about verbal game. And that was it. It's just like verbal. And the thing is, like when I have students um, who don't speak English, like what's the point of teaching them like openers or routines, or even like you know, I growing up, you know, I was born in Texas, but my family spoke Vietnamese at home. So I would go out into the real world and I speak English, but I would speak Vietnamese back home. So even though like. Theoretically, I am like completely fluent at English. I still have that sort of dichotomy of being like, you know, the, the offspring of immigrants. Um, so it's evolved where I have to approach things in a more a quote unquote holistic, which just means just being well rounded, you know, inner game, outer mm-hmm. game, verbal game. Because again, some of my students can barely speak English. I remember, you know, Matador and I, we used to wing together before he became VA. And um, I remember him cornering me in Crest at a club, and then he was teaching two Japanese guys, right, straight from Japan. He was like, he was like shaking me, he's like, what the fuck do I do with these guys? Like, they, they can't remember anything, they can barely speak English. I'm like, just teach them direct. Just tell them, like, go up to a girl and say, you are fucking beautiful. And it works because they say it in a very sincere way, and they get the accent, so they're saying like, you are fucking beautiful. And it works, right? Um, so yeah, the ABCs has evolved from like, very hardcore pickup to more, you know, just trying to be well rounded because, you know, sp- too much specializing, specializing in techniques is a disservice to like the clientele that I'm, that I'm getting. Yeah. So dude, let's talk about this because you were like, Hey man, the uh, good job on the Asian PUA video, mm. dude. So there's a couple things going on that yeah. I'd actually like to ask you. Yeah. Number one, how do you help these Asian dudes? Because it's not just about being Asian. But then the the second thing is to this is, dude, this market of teaching Asian guys, dude, you actually started it. And, no. you know, there's there's Fuji who's been teaching for a long time, too. You got to give him respect. But now there's this new market of like Asian PUA guys. And I don't think they're sending the same message as what you are, you know. So right, right. let's start number one with how do you help guys? Like what what is the whole Asian PUA thing with you? Well, you have to understand, and this is kind of how you can tell a professional like coach from an amateur coach, because when I was an engineer, I had to teach a lot of different types of people, old people, young people, brainiacs, like not so smart people. So I never necessarily put my experience and assume that my experience is the same as his, because I'll have Asian Americans who are born here completely fluent, you know, they know how to dress. They know how to be, you know, socialized with white people. Then I'll have guys like straight off the boat, straight from like China. And then right. even from like those guys, we'll have kind of like the, the middle lower class, you know, so they're more like quote unquote fobby. But then there's a newer class. I call them like um, the, uh, like they have the, the little emperor syndrome or what I call, they're the sons of communist generals. Like these mm. completely entitled Chinese dudes that, get laid like crazy back in China because they're the son of some politician or rich, you know, dude. And they come here and they're like, I'm important, but why doesn't anybody pay attention to me? So you get like a lot of different kind of Asian students and I've learned to kind of like, okay, this is what he needs and this is what he needs because, you know, I coming from an Asian American, I understand that perspective. Um, but I can't simply say, hey, this will work for like a fobby Asian guy because there are different things that you have to teach them. Like, what I've learned in my experience, and I think you could agree with this, Asians in general probably have some of the most debilitating limiting beliefs of the PUA community. 
right? Because I'm sure you, you've heard this all yeah. the time, like, oh, white girls, blah, 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 blah. Asian Americans, because we're born here, we, you know, I get living in the South, I got called a gook, a chink, a slant on, all that kind of stuff. But someone from Asia has never heard that. Like, he's coming from China or Japan, and he's the top dog. So he doesn't necessarily have those limiting beliefs. His limiting beliefs might be like, oh, I'm different, or I don't speak the language. But he doesn't feel like what we call that internalized racism, where he feels inferior to white people. So I'll have like Asian Americans where they, they have like the, the, the skill set, the fashion, the body language, all that stuff, but their limiting beliefs are just debilitating. Well, I have like the Fabi Asians where they don't know how to talk, they don't know how to dress, they don't know how to approach, they don't know how to banter, uh, but they don't have like the deep level insecurities that an Asian American has. Right. So, you know, coming in, I'll have to like, okay, this is what I got to teach this guy, this is what I have to teach this guy. Because some of them, like, they might have the perfect skill set, but if their mentality is fucked up, it doesn't matter if you give them the best material, it's their mentality that's fucked up. Right. Man, so, like, where do you start with a guy who has that mentality? Because, like, I hear a lot of that, mm -hmm. like, just on the message boards or whatever, we're going to finally get white women or, you know, like, the, like a lot of the anger. And, mm -hmm. like, dude, I mean... We all have anger. I have anger. It's just voiced in a different way. But if I make decisions out of that anger, life yeah. doesn't usually end up too good. So, like, where do you start with a guy who has those beliefs? Yeah. <clears throat> well, there are, there are two perspectives. Like, there's me as a teacher. And objectively, yes, racism it exists. It's especially here in mm -hmm. America. We are a race based society. Well, over in Europe, it's more class based. But it exists multiple studies um but that doesn't help the student like i can you know abstractly understand that racism exists and there are forces at play in society um but as a student if you're trying to learn and try to improve yourself by concentrating on that it becomes like this sort of virus that undermines your confidence the more you obsess about it we call like that bitter asian man syndrome and i used to be that way i used to be in college i always like so angry like, you know, there are all the statistics you see on TV, like Asian girls are just like dating white guys. Like yep. I was the angry Asian guy in, in college. Um, the thing is, as I learned, it's like the more you think about that, the more it undermines your own efforts to, to be better. Huh. But what I see with my students, you know, over time, that mentality isn't going to change. Um, I think one of the best ways to try to destroy stereotypes is to show people um, of different races interacting and connecting intimately. So obviously when it comes to the infield portion, people have to see this. People have to see me talking to beautiful girls or approaching like a group of girls that they wouldn't normally you know, expect to be receptive to me or my coaches or making up with them. Um, and in those cases, it is definitely seeing is believing. And as I always tell my students, like I wish I was tall, dark and handsome, but I can settle for being short, steady, and smooth. Like if I can do that, like being five foot five, you can do it. Right, right, dude, man. Like, uh, you know, that's one of those things. Like the the beliefs will just fuck you up. Doesn't matter what your results are if your beliefs don't change, they'll they'll cripple it. Or like you'll get results and then your foundation will fall out underneath you. Mm -hmm. uh, do guys like? take a lot like do they take one workshop two i mean is it like a community that you've built because it sounds like you have you really have a lot to offer guys in experience with this sort of mentality and working around it and stuff like that yeah well a lot of it depends on the foundation that they're coming in from like i said some of the guys they come in and they have nothing which is i think maybe different from other people's like programs or i sort of have to assume that they come in with with like level zero in everything. So you have to build them from, from, from the ground up. Um, so I'll have guys that have taken, you know, multiple boot camps and we give her alumni like 25% off. It's like a, a buy three, get one free kind of deal. Right? Awesome. Um, well, other guys, they're just on the precipice. They're just like on the precipice. Like I remember in New York, you know, I had one like really fobby guy uh, from Malaysia, and we, we gave him a haircut. He made out with his first girl, which is like a black girl, on like Saturday night. He was like, yeah. And like on Sunday, he was like on the verge of tears. And now, like, he is like this big stud on campus where he's got a couple, like, you know, friends with benefits. 
and he's a complete fog, but he's now he's a cool fog, right? And he doesn't need to take any kind of program because he, he got it at that right time. He's young enough. He's in mm. college. He learned everything, and he can you know use that to catapult himself. While other guys like they can learn the skill set, but because they don't have the right mentality, it's like the coefficient of friction, right? Like some of that will slowly degrade. While those guys who have the right mentality, they learn the skill, they can go with it full speed ahead while those, you know, with the wrong mentality, you can teach them everything that you know, but they lose it because they're not consistently applying it. It's like Aristotle said, excellence is not an action. Excellence is a habit. And when you don't have mm. the right, right mentality, like to me, inner game is longevity. It's your fire in your belly that allows you to last for a long time, not be a, like a, simply like a flash in the pan. Man, that's, dude, I think that's great. Like I think anybody listening to this like a lot of people don't get this that a lot of guys need long-term stuff and the fact that you offer 25 percent off that's pretty cool you know so a guy could do two or three like interactions with you guys at different levels like if people just went off of the m3 model like where sticking points tend to happen it's like the whole opening thing is like fucking eludes you at first mm -hmm. or whatever but then you'll have sticking points at like qualification comfort or whatever and then you need a little help there. And then it's like pulling or going on dates and stuff like that. You need a little help there. And so you just, man, it's really helpful. And it takes, you know, sometimes months or yeah. depends on the learning curve. And like um, for me personally, when I still lived and I was doing like that Project Hollywood thing, um, I was holding down a nine to five engineering job. But I had the, the determination to get better and to really master this. So I went out four to six nights a week. I would drive up from Hermosa Beach which is in, up to Hollywood like four times and that's like a 45 minute drive up, 45 minute drive back down and then I would go on like maybe like you know two two days, two nights in Hermosa Beach um, and that was that level of consistency, that was my level of determination. Yeah. Most people can't do that. But, right, totally. <laughs> but for me doing that, um, I would say it took me about a year to go from a complete scrub that couldn't get any girl on a speed dating event, like zero girls chose me on speed dating, to like a year, right, where when I went to like Europe, I was getting laid like mad. That was like the right. culmination when I was like, I knew I had made it. But that was a year going out like, you know, four to six nights every single week. Yeah, I think that that's one thing, like it used to be said way back when in pickup that every good person went out a lot. And I think, you know, I, dude, it was nuts for me. I mean, for mm -hmm. years I went out a lot, but most people can't do that. It sounds like the same thing for you. But I think an average guy who has a career and all that sort of stuff going out once or twice, or it depends on even how you're, like, if you're doing stuff in the daytime or whatever, but like, uh, there's different ways to do it. And so that's that like learning curve and then like how much you can actually go out and do stuff and practice this sort of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like going to the gym. Like, if you only go once a week, nothing's ever going to happen. Maybe like two, three, you'll start to see transformation. But if you want to be like ripped, like you know, you you want to be like that six pack Calvin Klein model, then you got to like go there like four times, five times a week. It depends on like what your goal is, you know, to understand what you're looking for, and then to apply yourself. I mean, that is something that yes, is not going to be something that like mere mortals can achieve but anything worth doing is not going to be easy so dude uh let me ask you this about the coaches and all that sort of stuff and because now asian pickup is like a a thing right, right. It, and it used to be like back in 2009 where guys were teaching in asia and they were kind of like white dudes teaching in yeah. asia but now you're going to japan and you're doing that, but then also there's this niche of like guys who are kind of like, you know, doing this brand that you have done for fucking a long time. Like you're right. a true expert in and have the experience towards yeah. it. I'm an OG, right? <laughs> you are. Dude, what's the difference? Because there's a difference. I can see the difference. It's not the same thing. Um, like what are your thoughts on that? Like on the, the subset of the Asian PUA community? Yeah, and the different coaches coming out of it because they're new school, man. They're, yeah. And they're, they're doing like new school pickup guy stuff. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not the – and actually what I see is a lot of these guys like 
bumping the Asian man myth. It's like, see, I'm dating white chicks and probably shit that you did, you know, fucking 10 years ago. And yeah. you had to get it or maybe you did or didn't, but you got it out of your system and now you've evolved to the next thing. And I think that that story is important, you know. Yeah. But what are your thoughts on like a lot of these uh, new dudes coming out, you know, without fucking saying names or whatever? Right, but, like, right. Well, whenever I talk to colleges and, you know, get all these students, it's like sort of like six degree. What are they like? Uh, six degrees of Kevin Bacon? Yeah, Something yeah. Something like that, that game. Everybody knows some Asian guy that's practicing pickup. Like every college I've been to. Yeah. And that is the prevalency of, of Asians in pickup. This is why I think every kind of pickup company tries to concentrate some energy on the Asian community in general because it is so ubiquitous. And for those who are curious as to why that's so, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons from religion to culture, but also there's a very numerical, like very, you know, uh, physical barrier because there are something like 24 million missing Chinese women because of female infanticide. And that's just in China. We're not even talking yeah. about like Korea or the 800,000 missing from like India. India, yeah. Yeah, so there's literally not yeah. enough women for Asian men to go around. Then you have the media at play. So there's a very real need um, that just goes beyond guys not understanding women, you know. Uh, and so what my community, where I came from, was that old school pickup. And at the time, the Asian Playboy blog was sort of like sex in the city, but for Asian guys. And I was pretty much the first Asian guy that ever put himself out there when it came to dating. Everything else, for those who are familiar with the Asian community, it was like the bitter Asian man .com. Like literally there's that. And then one of the most famous Asian American blogs is Angry Asian Man. That it started off as very angry and political to like a famous news aggregator. But that's where it came from. Right? So you had a lot of these guys that were bitter, very angry, um, and I came in, I had one of the first Asian male dating blogs, and one of the things I started to understand was that the, the PUA community didn't really service the Asian American community very well, but at the same time, the Asian American community didn't deal with this problem because it's all about whining, it's all about complaining. Right? I remember one time I had gotten so rejected, like twice in one night, by like this racist dude and by this racist girl, like in the same night. And I'm like, it was like the, one of the worst nights. I went home and I cried. I remember typing on the boards. Like the PUA community was like, just intergame that shit. You have no game. Right, <laughs> you, know, you, yeah. you can go to Ku Klux Klan rally and hit on that blog, the white pointy hat. You know, right. That, that PUA magic myth. While the Asian American community was like, it's the white man's fault. You know, it's media's fault, it's Hollywood's fault. Mm. And so neither one of them really had a solution. And that's kind of where I came in. I started to feel right. that. Um, I think what you're seeing is sort of this kind of like the new school guys um, is that sort of subset of, of graduating class. Um, because I think you and I, again, not to mention names, um, and I realized that he's taken someone that we know as boot camp. But he's also taken one of my boot camps. <laughs> so they kind of go off and they graduate. And unfortunately, some of them don't teach well. Uh, and some of them teach more new school, but it's like pure technique. And when you still don't have that kind right. of foundation, you're still maybe doing like douchebag game, right? It can be right. a complete douchebag. Or what's sort of popular overseas is they, they do a literal translation of like the mystery method and they, they, they apply it to like, you know, Japanese style pickup or Chinese style pickup. And the fact that they're trying to do something in the first place means they are getting results, but it's very kind of uncalibrated. Um, Cause like in Japan, they have a style called Nampa. And you know, when I was in Japan, just kind of watching this was very funny because it was very much, you know, just complete shotgun. Like just like boom, 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 boom. Um, so yeah, you'll, you'll definitely see like this kind of like newer group, but you know, it, it's still very much in the pickup uh, kind of community while, again, this may, might just be me um, in my perspective, but I tend to be more kind of more mainstream Asian American at this point. Like I'll get like a PUA guy in a boot camp, but he'll be like one out of 10 guys. And I tend to mm -hmm. prefer that quite frankly, because teaching hardcore PUA guys, honestly, in my opinion, is, it's not fun. I mean, I used to do that, yeah. but they would be like, I get these guys sometimes like, JT, I'm a 30 year old virgin, but I want you to teach me how to get a threesome. 
I'm like, yeah. let's teach you how to be normal and cool first before yeah. we get to that. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are different levels of, of uh, these kind of different groups. Um, and then, you know, like I said, there's a hardcore Asian, like hardcore pickup group. Well, I tend to try to service, again, I've moved to that direction more sort of, sort of like normalized dating. Dude, I'll tell you this, man. Like, I think with just the new school pickup guys in general, one of the problems is, is they can be really good. They can they can help you get laid. Like, mm -hmm. you you can, you know, whatever. You can have more sex in your life, but it, which is cool, you know, and that's exactly maybe why you signed up. But, man, let me tell you from experience, that's not going to sustain. And if somebody comes in, especially with a, a poor mindset, mm -hmm. I mean, dude, and here's the fucking thing. Like, you got it. You know, you you got to the level of what pickup was supposed to offer and, and you defined it. Not very few people get there. So you got there, you know, by whatever, 2007 or six or whatever the hell it was, right? You were there. And I don't know if this was for you, but like, you know, I'm getting there by 2007, 2008. Um, and it's like, I'm realizing it's not all there. And then there's nobody in the community to really show you because they're like, it's just, it, it's so immature. It's such a new thing, you know? And so you are like one of the, the big founders and dudes need to realize that there's some wisdom in that. And especially for Asian men, because dude, you're, you've fucking done it the longest and you've also done it while getting results for yourself personally while coaching the whole fucking time. Yeah. You know, dude, that's such a difference in where you see these other guys going in with like, you know, these little hacks or whatever. And not to degrade that because, dude, you've probably done that. I've done that. Mm -hmm. We got results from it. But the real result to give you confidence is much different. And dude, I'll tell you this, man. When I do workshops and there's guys from like, let's say, Nepal, India, uh, anywhere, uh, you know, Japan, China, whatever is Asian, the guys being a little bit shorter, the guys being a little bit more meek, you know, I'm not a tall guy to begin with. Um, but it's amazing how many people will pick fights with them. So <laughs> if a guy picks a fight with me, I mean, I don't know what it is. It's like, I'm not trying to give off a certain demeanor, but they, nobody ever wants to fight. Nobody, here's some advice for everybody out there. Nobody's ever going to get aggressive if they think they might lose. And not saying that I put off a certain tough demeanor at all, at all. Like, I'm not even trying to say that. But a lot of times they'll see, like, these dudes that are shorter or more passive. And they, they might be like, dude, they're not consciously or logically thinking of this. But it's the scenario of, like, I can win. All right, I'm going to push this guy. Yeah, like, they, they, I they, never they, get fucking pushed. Yeah, it's the, the thing that this guy's going to be easy pickings, right? Yep. Um, yeah, yeah. And I guess when a guy goes through that or sees it happening to him and then pickup says, hey, just enter game it out. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's like people don't realize like pickup is not magic, right? Um, I mean, that's – and I see this and, and this certainly frustrated me. But when I was like the hardcore, like Asian playboy, when I was going like 120%, cranking up to 11, I was like – you know, I had like the Fu Manchu. I was doing the hat. I remember one time I was with like eight students and like my coach and like this kind of black guy comes up and starts talking to me and then another guy comes up and says, like, dude, dude, don't mess with them. They're triad. <laughs> you know, like he grabs his friend and pulls them out. And that's kind of like, because we were rolling deep and I looked like, in retrospect, I looked like an Asian douchebag, but I gave up that kind of like badass vibe with my kind of like triad Manchu goatee, like not giving a fuck about anything. Um, but yeah, a mogging, cock blocking, it's very common. Like I get it. Like anytime I'm out with my girlfriend, it's just like, like she says she's never been hit on. Like she'll get hit on, but she never gets hit on as much as when she's with me. Like, and that is true of every single girl I've ever dated in the past. Every single wing girl, like it, it gives them such an ego boost, right? Because they'll get hit on like twice as much, and it is because typically we're on the short side. Now I've had like you know big students, like very bulky students that are tall, and that's going to dissuade people. So it's part attitude, but also just part like physical stature, right? Totally. So I mean, it's just just being real. But if they're a short guy, there are ways to counteract that and the ways to dealing with it. Um, I think I have one of like the very first viral PUA um, videos. There was like that A mod combat. Because that's what I used to teach in my in my um, classes was how to deal with guys. Because 
I would have them come in out of woodwork like they were ninjas. So is this something that I'm going to deal with and I have to teach my students because if you're going to date beautiful girls, like you just have to learn how to deal with other guys. That's the cost of doing business, right? If you're going to date a beautiful girl, you have to learn how to deal with other competent guys because those are the type of guys that's going to want to approach her. And then also you've done this for a while too with your workshops where you have females <clears throat> working with you, right? Like a female assistant coach to help out with body language and all that sort of stuff. Absolutely. That, okay. Yes, that's... That's a cool thing just for, especially guys, if you <clears throat> haven't had any, I mean, like you could break down touching, mm. but like. <laughs> it's always awkward when you try to get another dude. <laughs> if you're trying it for the first time in field and it really terrifies you, it can really, like, it can, yeah, it can yeah. not go so, well, I don't want to say not go so hot, but it can be really terrifying. You know, it'll right, just right. that well, much more. Uh, one thing I, I learned over, over my progress, again, when I was being like that hardcore pickup, and, and this goes back to what you were saying, saying previously, when all you're doing is teaching pickup and techniques and just getting laid, it's a panacea. It's it's a short-term kind of band-aid over, you know, you're treating the symptom as opposed to the actual cause. And yeah, when you're in pain, you just need to get laid as fast as you can and get that over with. Um, and by involving girls, they, <clears throat> What I was trying to do was trying to make it more rounded because when it's just like 10 dudes, like you get a certain kind of energy and it's all like testosterone and it's all this kind of like you start kind of putting down women and being like very misogynistic and you start creating this kind of warped and you see this a lot in Kiwi community, this kind of warped mentality of how to treat women. But not, and that carries over in how if you're going to treat a woman like this, who could be the future mother of your child? Like, how are you going to treat other people if this is, like, someone that's supposedly going to be someone special in your life? I mean, there's a time and place for a locker room, like, for that men's locker room talk right. and attitude. But, again, I was like, I wanted to throw in a, a bit of estrogen uh, uh, and, and give these guys a more well-rounded experience as, as opposed to being just like, okay, we're just going to practice techniques and tactics and getting laid and that's it. We're not going to do deep-level identity change. And that's what I was seeing with my students is, you know, I could teach all the techniques, but again, it was a lot of times just a short-term kind of band-aid. They get laid. Like I used to go to Vegas and do boot camps all the time because I had a girlfriend and that was amazing and it was fun. But Vegas is an artificial environment, right? Totally. And it's easy to get laid there, but when you move back home, right, now you have to deal with the real world, the non-Vegas, non-like – kind of club girls, and what are you gonna do then if all you know are club techniques? Um, so again, there's a lot of that involved, just like pulling women in to the boot camp, pulling women into your life, and again, kind of that deeper level identity change. Cool, man. man. Yeah, that's one thing that's crazy, especially for guys who are just coaches, is you, I mean, you learn a skill, you just get so much experience, you kind of get to know women, whatever it is, it's very hard to get caught up in that thing where it's like, man, when you're in pain or you're lonely, like, you know how to get laid. Like, you know, it can happen. I mean, you go through dry spells and through goods, but, but dude, give yourself a week or whatever. And it's yeah. like, you can, you can kind of get back on the horse, but that might not always be what you need and all that sort of stuff. So relationships and figuring all that sort of stuff out, that's God, man, it's just such a trip. For, I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's very important for, for guys to be in a relationship or have at least a couple under your belt. Like, it all kind of depends on the student because yeah. I'll have guys that are just zero monogamous. They go, they bounce from one relationship to the other. I'm like, okay, try to be single for a while as opposed to like desperately clinging onto one girl. Well, I have guys that were like, I want to sleep with 100 girls. I'm like, you haven't slept with one. So let's just get you like somebody to be with. Um, and for me, I've, I've done both. I've, I've done like the the monogamy thing, I've done like the open relationship thing, and I've done just playing the field. And at this point, I, I don't feel the need to be in a relationship. Like if it's there, it's there. Especially with my lifestyle, I'll be yeah. like, hey, like, hey, let's hang out. But, you know, I'm, I'm trying to build a business and it, I don't feel that need to be around like someone specifically, unless it's someone like I enjoy. Dude, so where's the ABCs of attraction going, man? Oh, it's going everywhere. <laughs> well, I think I've been doing like college talks, which is really fun because it's sort of a different arena and is dealing with 
tangential kind of topics of pickup, but I enjoy it because it's also dealing at a higher level. Because how many ways, and you, you know this, Steve, but how many ways can you teach a guy how to get a number? Like, I've written like a thousand articles, like, there's only so many ways you can skin a cat, right? But if I'm talking like Harvard or Yale or Wharton or Rutgers or whatever, I, I can talk about like higher level issues of like the bamboo ceiling or how to get a job, how to use social skills to, you know, negotiate a, a job salary or like talking with your parents and family. So, because like pickup is just human communication, just concentrated on presenting yourself to the opposite sex, right? Um, but that's useful, as I say, from like the bedroom to the boardroom. So that's fun. I'm, I'm going into that route as well, kind of being a, a paid college speaker. Um, eventually going into more sort of <clears throat> Asian social skills in general, not necessarily dominated by just like the pickup side, because um, I don't know if you, you did you have like a tiger dad, a tiger parent? Was it was your uh, parents? No, my dad just worked. I mean, my dad's Japanese, and he just went uh -huh. very Japanese work style. <laughs> right. So I had like the tiger mom, and I'm sure like all other Asians they had like that tiger parent that are like study blah blah blah. And then it's like Asian parents they will they will send their kids off to to classes called like Chinese cramming school. Like I'll have parents that will buy their kid a boot camp. And they'll send their kid to my boot camp, which is like <laughs> kind of cool, right? And so that's that what is. I want to want to do is like kind of like these social skills because parents will send their kids um, to be more successful because that's ultimately what it is. If you know the, it's not education that will necessarily dictate your success. It's how you communicate and how emotionally intelligent you are. And I think parents will recognize that, and they are kind of slowly recognizing that it's not enough to send your kids off to cram school. It's not enough to send them off to like violin school or like piano school or SAT school. You got to give them a well-rounded education. Yeah, no, man, definitely. And I'll even say this because there's like a lot of just with all the coaches talking or whatever, because uh, everybody's trying to train, especially he's been doing it so long. It's like there's so much more to it than just women. That's just a lot of places where we started. But Jesus Christ, man, if you can show somebody to up their career value by 30 mm percent, -hmm. You know, twenty percent. You know, fifty percent. If you can up that, man, that's an amazing work. That's totally worth it. Yeah, you know, to yeah. Negotiate a raise or whatever it is. God yeah. damn. When I talk about like the bamboo ceiling, like statistically, they say something like thirty uh, percent of Silicon Valley computer programmers are Asian American, but less than sixty-six percent, a single digit, is like management. And wow. You know, computer programmers. You know, stereotypically Asians, we kind of dominate computers. Now, let's be real here. But we get paid yeah, right? less than women do, like on average. Like yeah. that's supposed to be our field. So there's a lot of room for, for growth and improvement. And, and this is what I learned as an engineer. And this is what disillusioned me working for the government and, and the corp corporations was I was working my ass off. Like at one point I got this $10,000 like bonus check for getting a spacecraft through testing like uh, faster through the earlier through schedule. But I looked around and like there were like five entry engineers and three of us were, you know, people of color and then two were white and the two got promoted like two or three levels and we stayed at the bottom. And I'm like, what's going on? We're working hard. And that's when I started learning pickup and I'm like, there's another layer of communication that I'm not privy to because I'm just working hard. And your boss is like, great, he's working hard for me. He's going to make me money. Let me hang out with my buddy and we form these kind of connections, right? Um, so I learned the idea of not being a sexual drone as well as not being a worker drone. Um, so mm. that is that kind of translation of like mentality from pickup to also the, the workforce. Man, that's so interesting because like, uh, I mean, uh, maybe I should take a closer look at like your current marketing. But what I hear you fucking saying that's so awesome <clears throat> is that the cultural immersion or playing field or whatever it is of the Asian man at this point in our culture, in American or whatever, even Western business culture, dude, it, it's a skill that needs to be learned Absolutely. on all levels. <clears throat> Absolutely. It's I, fucking amazing. You I, know, I, and, and that's so much more of a solution <clears throat> than it's just like, how am I going to get this? Like, how am I going to get the bigger paycheck? How am I going to get the white chick? How am I going to, you yeah. know, whatever, fuck these bitches, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. Dude, it, 
if like that is is pretty unbelievable. Yeah, you know? one of my clients, he's like uh, the VP of some like Fortune 500 company, and so he came over like back in like the 80s as like some some Asian guy, and the way he said it, it was very interesting. I and I agree with this. Not that he you know felt racism against him, like holding him down. But what he felt was like no one was helping him up. He kind of like looked around to like the old boy, the like white boy club, and like they were mentoring each other. Like there was no one to mentor him, and so he had to do it on his own, bootstrap himself up. And if there's a way that I can help like other Asian Americans, whether they're men or women, to short shortcut that, right, and to get up to that yeah. elevated height, um, because. Mentoring, I mean, I'm sure you know this, it's the same thing with coaching. When you get mentored, you are more likely to be successful than someone who isn't, right? So I think that's the feeling with Asians um, is that no one's really holding us down. It's not like the white man's holding us down, but we don't necessarily get the, the same help, helping hand, right? Yeah, no, man, that's interesting. I mean, God, if you look at the education level, um, the work ethic, all the different stuff that comes into the Asian communities, yet at the same time making less money, getting less recognition, mm. possibly less respect, you know, whether it's intentional or not. Because race, I mean, there is for real racism there. Right. Just, you can't really fucking, you got to get somewhere where you can speak or have a voice to change that, you yeah. know. But God damn, man, you know, women too. Fuck, mm. dude, that's, that's a, that, that, <laughs> that is a beautiful model and direction for ABCs of attraction to fucking kick ass with. Yeah. So that's badass. Dude, I know you have a, you have a coaching call coming up, so we got to cut this short. No. But um, man, just awesome props. Uh, like, like even back in the Dallas stuff uh, and keeping it together. And just think about that. You know, at one time in Dallas, you know, you lived there, a uh, prominent VA instructor at the time, uh, uh, Brock lived there. There were a bunch of coaches that lived there. Sin lived there. Uh, CJ lived there. There were just all these dudes. And then also students who weren't even teachers who were like way up there. But it all got divided. <laughs> God, for the yeah. ego and identity of stupidity. Yeah, I don't want to say, like, I'm sure you've heard these like, stories. It's like, it just blew my mind. You know, and it was just unfortunate at that time. That was like when I was leaving because it's literally there was a point where we it was like Dallas, like Project Dallas, because we would just be rolling. It wasn't like I wasn't even yeah. getting paid, or it was just like just oh, yeah, paying expenses. Were, I was just like, let's grab twenty guys and let's go and get laid. Yeah, <laughs> you were no, you were like a guy you could stop people in their tracks on the dance floor. I mean, you were very known for like everything that Pickup was offering and in. in Dude, this guy, I mean, he would talk shit on me. He would talk shit on uh, John and, and CJ. He would talk shit on you. And you you got in a fight with him and, like, <laughs> stupid shit. And, like, we were like we were all down to help. I mean, like, we were all down to help in different ways. But uh, It's like I'd, the power. It's like that. And the thing is, I see this with other cities. And it just, yep. like, people get egos. And this is something yeah. I, I think I, I talked about on one, on, on one conference is – Especially if you go on the pro route, I think you went through the cycle. It's like you you get good and you're like you're awesome, and then you kind of become an asshole douchebag, and then you burn out and you travel the world and find yourself, and then you rise like the phoenix and kind of reinvent yourself. Um, so I've experienced burnout a couple of times, and one of the things that I, I've learned to do is just like just keep myself in a mentally healthy place, yeah. right? And it's more about like that mission. Like I, I like to say, like my company has a a real mission that's beyond just getting laid. Because if it's just getting laid, then it's just about satisfying right. your own ego. Dude, it's a funny thing because people always bring up infield, 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 and like you're one of the first guys to shoot the infield insider. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, that's a funny thing. Like people ask me, where's my infield? Like I was the first one that me how call. Like yeah. my DVD is the very first like commercial infield DD, DVD that ever existed. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and when I talk to people about that, it's like, dude, yeah, it's not that important. Like, I hate that. Like, if that's the message that I'm sending, uh, you know, and, and we're planning some production stuff for Infield, but like in a normal way, like wow. in a way that is not this stupid shit. And uh, anyway, whatever, man. Like I said, like, Another Infield, it's, it's educational. But again, like we were talking about a little bit earlier, so for a lot of guys, it's just a band-aid. Like, it's more like treating the symptom. 
rather you than the I'll tell you this, cost. man. You know what it creates? It creates a bunch of fanboys who don't do <laughs> shit, who worship these guys, yeah. and then fucking have... Then, then the, it's like when you're like, hey, you know, there's more to pick up than this shit, and pickup's kind of stupid when you're looking at it through a filter of only this. It's like you're insulting their fucking masculinity that they don't even own, that they've given to somebody else. It's like this attack on their religion that they don't even practice, that they can't right. even do. Anyway, whatever. Final words, man. What do you, what do you got to say? Uh, what I always say to my, my students, um, be successful because you're Asian, not in spite of it. The, we have a long history of being successful in like masculinity, yeah. the art of war. Like I said, like as a Vietnamese person, like there's not an inch of Vietnam that isn't like, you know, soaked in just, just defending our country. And you see this in Japan and, and China, they're like the warrior scholars that somehow moving here, we kind of lost our sense of masculinity. And yes, part of it is the media, but you know, be successful because you're Asian, not in spite of it. Like, and a way to defeat that kind of racism and stereotype to make other women see us as, as masculine men is it starts with us first. It starts with us making that effort and showing them that we are that man of her dreams because we've worked on ourselves. Man, that's really, really badass. You know, that's that's a beautiful, beautiful message. You know, a lot of that thing that makes Asian men feel bad about it or whatever, you know, man, that comes from, dude, a massive history. And like, it, it's funny because I being half Japanese, like the Japanese weren't always so popular. I think a lot of people have kind of chilled out with that mentality. Yeah. But pretty much everybody in Asia <laughs> fucking hated us because yeah. we were, it was, it was a shitty culture, man. And Japan has changed in many ways, you know, but uh, there's so much diversity in beauty to Korean culture, to Vietnamese, to all of Southeast Asia, man. I mean, just to, to Indian culture, which is massive, to Chinese, which is massive. I mean, fucking A, man. Yeah, like Learn. you don't you don't have to be like quote unquote white to be successful in curls. I yeah. challenge anybody who says that. Like you can be proud of who you are, right? And yeah. use that to your advantage. And like I'm a short guy and I'm an Asian guy and I use that to my advantage. If I'm dating a white girl, I'll teach her about my Asian culture. And Fuck like yeah. nine times out of ten, she's never been with an Asian guy. And so the fact that I'm educating her, but I'm not doing it like a boring way. I'm like letting her explore this. And that's fun whether you're like an experienced guy teaching her wine because you're, you know, a connoisseur yeah. in that sense or you're teaching her about the, um, you know, the food of your culture, your cuisine. Wow. Women are still drawn into that because you're sure of yourself. It's like, you know, the, the, the idea of like the kid in the garage band, like he might not have a life really, but women follow him because he's passionate about his music, his arts. And that's more important than being like a boring guy. If you're passionate about what you do and who you are, your sense of identity will basically extend to them. And they'll be one be a, they'll want to be a part of it, right? And there are women, I've found women that find the Asian aesthetic very ple very pleasing and they'll want to be part of that. But you gotta make that effort as an Asian guy. You gotta go out there and you gotta represent. Man, fuck yeah. Dude, I dig that. Mm -hmm. Awesome, dude. I'm going to let you go because you got like five minutes before yeah. you start your deal. Yeah. But I'm uh, very good talking to you. I'm glad we did it. We got to do it again. Yeah. Yeah. Next time in Austin, next time in LA, man. We'll do cool. a real life collab. All right. You got it. Laters. Thanks. Jerry Tran, uh, yes. also known as JT Tran, also known as the Asian Playboy. That's my, my stage name. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, has given whole new meaning to what I understand to be the ABCs. Uh, JT is the founder, <laughs> CEO, and instructor of the ABCs of Attraction. After graduating from college, and he's going to talk to us a bit about uh, what it was he was prepared to do when he graduated from 